one of the difficulties in figuring out what the government did versus some things that happened uh, despite of the government or despite of the government is that there have been a lot of changes in household characteristics. Iranian households are much smaller now. Uh, the people in poverty, the, their characteristics have changed from 1980s to 2000s. The different types of people now in that are in poverty. And the question is to what extent, for example, re reduction in fertility, which happened very uh, uh, abruptly after the end of the war with uh, Iraq uh, at the end of 1980s, to what extent did uh, reduction in household size and fertility reduce poverty and help out? It could be that th that factor by itself accounts for most of the uh, reduction in poverty and what the government was doing, with what happened to economic growth, etc., were irrelevant. There's also been massive expansion of education, and that also has played a role. We need to separate out these factors and figure out what is it exactly that is going on, and what uh, agencies really were helping out most. Uh, the technique that I'm going to be using here is uh, to separate out these factors is called quantile regression. Basically, the idea is to try to figure out how various factors have influenced the distribution of income. People at the uh, fifth percentile, tenth percentile, median, or maybe 90th percentile, people at the top of the distribution, 99th percentile. You try to figure out how these percentiles, different uh, individuals at different parts of the distribution might, be, might have been affected by every program, by every change in the economy. Uh, the, the way I'm going to be applying this, uh, I'm not going to go into details of estimation technique, etc. I know that this is it's going to get very technical. Uh, so I'm going to report the results basically, but to give you an idea what's the basis of the data that I'm using, uh, it's I'm using the, for the policy variables, uh, the spending programs, government spending, uh, welfare agencies. Twenty there are 24 provinces in Iran from. They've been divided to subdivided to smaller units later on, but I aggregate them and keep them at 24, which was the 24 that existed in early 1990s. And we're going to actually use 14 years of data, so 24 provinces over 14 years. And I use the variation across provinces and over time to try to figure out how each factor might have affected the outcome. So that's uh, basically the technique I'm going to be using. And uh, I'm going to try to control for household characteristics. Meanwhile, the data about the distribution comes from a data set which is called Household Income and Expenditure Survey. Uh, the survey about 25,000 to 50,000 households every year to figure out what they spend on, what's their income. And the, this data set has been used for many different purposes. It's a pretty good data set, rather unique among developing countries to have uh, collected this kind of data year after year. So I use the information from each province to see how, income distrib how the income distribution looks like in that uh, province, and then try to figure out how each factor, like government spending or changes in household characteristics, etc., have influenced the distribution. Uh, there are some uh, technical issues that I also address, trying to <coughs> make sure that the estimation is as accurate as possible. Now, before I go into the estimation results, let me give you a little bit of background of uh, sort of graphic to show how things have been moving in Iran uh, since the 1980s. This is what the data set tells us between 83 and uh, 2010. This line shows the median income, 50th percentile, person in the middle of the distribution. And you can see their incomes were dropping rather sharply in the early, in, in the mid uh, 1980s, then started increasing gradually and the scale on the left-hand side is large, but the 
key thing is the, the direction of change and to what extent things have changed. And you can see here that their incomes rose until mid-2000s. After that, there was a little bit of a drop, and then there was a sharp drop later after this, uh, in 2011, 2012. And that drop continues to this day. So that's the median income. This is the, uh, these are the people at the 50th percentile and 85th percentile. So you can see that the whole distribution has been moving together. And that says that in economic growth should have increased, lifted all incomes. However, it, this graph doesn't quite show to what extent the distribution has uh, been coming together and con contracting rather than expanding. And these are the other edges, 90th percentile and 95th percentile at the top, and then uh, 10th and 5th percentile at the bottom. One way to figure out how poverty has changed is to think about some line that uh, sets the, poverty, the absolute poverty, and everybody below this would be in poverty. And you can see that in the 1980s, we, we had about 40% of the population in abject poverty below this poverty line. And then eventually many of these groups uh, came out of poverty because income was growing, uh, especially in the 19, early 2000s. And in, in the mid-2000s, in fact, poverty rate by this measure was around 5 to 6%, which was huge in, in, uh, improvement over what had happened in the past. To give you an idea uh, how the people at the bottom of the population has been moving towards the median, here's the ratio of income of someone at the 15th percentile relative to the uh, median income. And you can see that there, was, there had been a gradual improvement. There are ups and downs, but gradual improvement, especially until mid-2000s. And this is the 10th percentile, and here's somebody at the 5th percentile. Somebody who really is at the, towards the bottom of the population. It shows that if in, in the 1980s, they were earning less than 30% of the median income, and it had gradually <coughs> increased well above it. it. The increase is not that big, but still there was a very clear trend and a, and a major improvement. Now, let, let me also introduce uh, in a little bit of detail the organizations that have been helping to reduce poverty in Iran and I'm going to be focusing on. One of the key ones is the Imam Khomeini Relief Foundation. There are other public foundations like it, but that's the biggest one and tries to identify the poor and support them in the, uh, through various programs. Yeah, uh, public spending program that might have some impact on income distribution, it's a major program, is the social welfare organization that provides retirement and pension benefits. Also, health insurance for uh, some government employees, some private sector employees. It's, sorry, it's, I mix these two up. Social security organization does that. Social welfare organization actually tries to uh, it's a government bureau bureaucracy, but it's trying to do something relatively similar to what the Imam Khomeini Relief Foundation does, to, uh, identifying the poor, but it focuses more on disabilities, people with disabilities, if they are, um, for example, addicts or they, are, uh, they, they have physical disabilities, they try to help them out. That it focuses on those people in, in poverty situations more than just uh, being identified as the poor. And then there's, uh, uh, there are a host of NGOs in Iran that do a lot of different things. To give you an idea how these organizations look like, let me first sort of draw here the poverty rate as a, to give you an idea how uh, that has declined over time. And here's what the IKRF has been doing. They have been spending more per household. Uh, and, and this is also, this is their uh, coverage, meaning that how many households were they supporting over time. And you can see that 
from 1990 onward, there has been a major increase in the number of how individuals that, that have been, uh, been covered by the organization per hundred households. The other organization that has been involved is the social security organization. And this one was increasing up to mid-1990s, then this is during the Khatami administration. It did not grow in terms of coverage, how many people it covers per 100 households. And then after that, again, was ex uh, basically the government in, in, uh, helped it out to, or asked it to expand and cover more people. Uh, there's the SS, the SWO, or the Social Welfare Organization, is relatively smaller compared to these two others. It covers about 10% of uh, households. And it's been relatively flat. Basically, after it was formed and it grew a little bit in the early 1990s, it hasn't changed all that much. And NGOs, the number of people that NGOs cover is relatively small. Uh, in fact, what happened in the around early 2000s, Khatami administration decided to support them. So some part of the budget of social welfare organization tra was transferred to NGOs and they were allowed to grow. And you can see here that as SWO is declining, NGO coverage is increasing. This is basically the same type of people covered by uh, social welfare organization being given to NGOs. But the two of them uh, are connected to each other. It's the same budget. So I actually, in my analysis, I just, uh, add them up into one organization. Some more uh, data on how these organizations and their spending have been related to increasing uh, government uh, in, in uh, individual spending and average incomes in the country. Here's the average. Uh, individual spending for the country and here's a, a measure of the median income that I had shown before. If you look at how government has been spending, now there are two types of government spending that I identify. One type I really can't use in my analysis, that's the overall central government in, in, in spending because that's the, basically the same expenditure for the entire country and I'm, I want to use variations across uh, provinces to figure out how spending has affected uh, individuals. So I'm going to actually focus on the rest of the government expenditure, which is provincial expenditure. This is the money that is uh, spent at the provincial level by the local governments there. And that number you can see has been increasing parallel to income, although slower than the average income. This is the expenditure of uh, IKRF that has also been growing. Th this, is, this shows the difficulties of figuring out what has been going on, which one of these factors has really been contributing, and that's the reason why we uh, detailed statistical analysis to figure out which one has really been contributing to income distribution in the country. Uh, I, just before showing the results, let me just mentioned that this is province level data and uh, including government spending, IKRF, the social welfare organization and social security organization. Uh, I, I'm including their levels of activity, some measures of their level of activity over 24 provinces. The period on which I focus is 93 to 2006. There's, the data is not very good before 93 besides uh, there was the early decade of revolution, it's quite, there's quite a turmoil and the system is not really settled. So, so it's after 1990s that it becomes easier to identify what's going on. And after 2006, uh, actually the government start, stopped publishing the kind of data that I need to use for my analysis. And, and that things changed a lot after Ahmadinejad came to office. So, that needs to be analyzed separately. So the, the number of observations is 336 province year cells, and as I mentioned, I'm using the household expenditure and income surveys, and the total number of 
households included in the analysis is uh, close to 350,000. Uh, I also allow for possibility of policy effects being different before Khatami administration and after Khatami administration. So uh, I'm going to discuss the differences between and, or similarities between the two periods. Uh, there's some technical issue also uh, in terms of taking account of the policy variables responding to poverty. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a difficult difficulty of identifying the effects because if you just look at the impact of government spending or IKRF spending on poverty, when poverty rises, they actually spend more. So if you don't take into account the causality effect and uh, account for this, it looks like whenever they spend more, there's more poverty. So I really need to deal with this issue of uh, so-called endogeneity, the uh, policy being determined within the system. So th th there's a technique called instrumenting with like values, which uh, I use, and uh, it, it actually does produce good and decent results. So let me actually show you the first result of all, all this analysis. I want to know first to what extent economic growth contributed to changes in income distribution, to incomes of people at different parts of the distribution, people at the top 1%, bottom 1%. And so I, if you put the quantiles, different percentiles of population on the horizontal axis. So the person, the poorest person is up here and the richest person is up there. And I look at the impact of average economic growth, uh, activity in the province on the level of income of <coughs> these individuals. It turns out that it, economic growth lifts all boats, but the boats of the rich get lifted a lot more. Uh, what th this is what this um, graph shows. The shaded area is the uh, confidence interval. So what the blue line is the average effect that I measure. So what, what this shows is that the person at the top has been benefiting from e uh, economic growth a lot more than the person at the bottom. So the verdict here is that economic growth in Iran has been unequalizing, just like many other countries. Economic growth is typically not equalizing, it's unequalizing. So the fact that income distribution has improved in Iran shows that there must have been other factors. Government uh, programs must have had major impact on lifting the income of the poor in order to bring, up, bring them up and closer to the average and to the people at the top. So, what did the government spending at the province, province level do? Again, this is the same type, type of analysis. The horizontal axis shows different percentiles of income distribution. And the question is, to what extent government spending increased incomes at different levels? And what, what it turns out that actually amazingly, province level expenditure has lifted incomes only at the bottom 20% or so no impact after that, which is uh, the fact that these spendings have been helping out people at the lowest income levels is quite interesting. Um, it, it's not obvious that when you spend, as I mentioned, both, there are two effects. One is that when government spends at the local level, it could be the powerful people who actually get the money uh, and they make sure this channel towards them. But it, if you look at the overall effect, it turns out that Indeed, the programs did help the poor. Uh, this is not including the spending at the, t uh, the overall level, the national level. That has had its own impact, which I'm not measuring here. I'm going to talk, talk about it briefly, uh, how that program might have affected everybody. Now, let me come to the IKRF effect. If I look at the expenditure of uh, IKRF, the Imam Khomeini Relief Foundation, on income, incomes of various groups in the country, it turns out that they have actually not 
been also doing relatively well. And their impact is positive and very significant, statistically speaking, and also quantitatively, on the incomes of the poor. They have managed to raise incomes of the poor by something like 15 to 20 percent at the very bottom of the distribution. And it tapers off as income rises. So people in the top 40 percent of the population have not been getting much benefit out of this expenditure, which is sort of <coughs> validates what they're claiming to some extent, that they are targeting the poor and they're passing on money to the, to the poor. And now, it's interesting to contrast this with one other activity that they have. They have a mandate to uh, provide a kind of pension to everybody over 65. This is called Rajoy program. And this was established uh, right after the, the revolution. And that was one of the ma first major programs that IKRF took on after the revolution. This program is supposed to be targeting the poor, but to, uh, because it's, it, it says that everybody can get it, in, a, in essence. Initially, it was only for the people in rural areas, and then they extended it to urban areas. You can see the impact, if I measure the impact, the same way I measure the impact of the others, is actually getting to the middle of income distribution, not to the poor. So the fact that in the, in the other program, the total spending of IKRF, they actually target the poor, they identify the poor, and they pass them the, the money rather than going by age, it shows that there's a huge difference in, in the outcome. It's the middle class is really getting the benefit of this. How about the social welfare organization and NGOs put together? It turns out that they go by disability, not so much by poverty. And the impact, again, is distributed much more widely and goes to the, to the middle class. The very rich are not beneficiaries of these programs. A lot of them have their own money. They go to their own doctors, their own services, etc. And the very poor are probably not in a situation to take advantage of this. It's the middle class that is the beneficiary. But the, it's interesting. It's a small program, but its impact is sizable. Uh, it raises the income levels in the middle of distribution by about 7 8 to 8% on average, which is still uh, sizable. The social security organization is, as I mentioned, it's a, it provides pension and retirement benefits and health insurance for government employees, some private sector employees. It has been expanding to other groups, for example, uh, independent workers, drivers of trucks recently were uh, last few years were allowed to actually join this program and benefit from its pension and uh, health insurance programs. And you can see that this one is help, helping out everybody in the top 80%. Nobody from the bottom is really benefiting from this. Because to be part of this, you need to be employed somewhere. And a lot of the people at the bottom are unemployed. So, so they don't get much benefit out of this. Now, SSO does have a program which is supposed to be providing benefits uh, it's an optional program meaning that you can join in if you want uh, you don't the government employees they, that are uh, part of this program they have to join but this one is voluntary and this one also has been benefiting the middle class as well the people at the very top and the very bottom are not part of this program probably the, uh, people at the bottom are not covered or not in a situation to take advantage, and the rich don't really need this program. Uh, they also in, have another program that specifically deals with uh, unemployment. And this one, suddenly you can see that it really is benefiting the very poor. The bottom 60% are beneficiaries of this program, and the richer groups are not really taking advantage of this. A lot of them probably don't become unemployed to take advantage of this program anyway. So this program is working uh, according to, to the mandate that it has, and it does seem to be contributing. And one might 
Excuse me, how much time do I have? Just want to make sure that I need. Oh, no, no, that can't be. <laughs> I'm an economist. Those are, so that's really what happened, my measurement of the impact of the government programs that I was looking at. One interesting issue is to what extent household characteristics contribute. For example, being in urban areas, does it raise your income or not, your real income? And it turns out that it does living in urban areas versus rural areas. But it turns out that it's actually much more, has a much bigger impact for the poor than for the rich. And rich people who live in rural areas are really well off and they're probably, they can, they have probably residences in both places. But the poor, when they are able to move to the urban areas, they suddenly take advantage of resources and benefits there. And, Another household characteristic which is very important is the head of household, a man or a woman. And it turns out that when it's a woman, it lowers, in, these are all negative numbers. It lowers the income level. Okay, so that's uh, accepted, but does it affect everybody in the distribution similarly or differently? And it turns out that if you're poor and head of household and you're a woman, you're much worse shape than you're in the top of the distribution. So, um, the, the, what one interesting thing about this is that it actually seems to be reflecting something that one can, uh, can expect and validates the, the technique and it says that it, the technique is capturing a lot of uh, the effects that we really want to see. Uh, here's. The other household characteristics, do we have children, for example, in the household, the number of children? It turns out that, that more children in the household reduces uh, income of the household and the expenditure of the household, uh, but it does so more for the poor than uh, it, it does for the rich. If you're rich, it doesn't seem to matter that much, but if you're poor, having additional children, it, it could be very costly. Uh, now, it, it, does it matter whether uh, when you have teenagers or not? The children are uh, below uh, 11 years, 11 and below, 12 and above are included in the teenagers here. And it turns out that these teenagers do have, do lead to higher levels of income. This could be because they bring some income or it could be because households actually have to work harder in order to support their teens to go to high school and therefore they, they have more income and more expenditure. And having elderly in the household turns out to actually increase the household's income and expenditure. A lot of times because they, they have some pension or some benefits that they bring to the household. Uh, I'm controlling for the household size, so if the size of the household goes up, controlling for a number of children, etc. It, it's a, when you have more ha larger households, your expenditure and your income must be larger, and it turns out that that actually, that effect is much bigger uh, at the lower end of the distribution than the higher than the upper part of the distribution. Of course, if these additional members happen to be children, then that has a negative effect and it, uh, sort of counteracts with this. Um, another thing that has changed a lot in, in Iran is uh, education. So I look at this education of non-students, people in the household who are adults but not students. And because these are the people who are potentially income earners. And I add up their years of education to figure out what's the number of years of education in the household that can be used for income earning. And it turns out that that improves income. All these numbers, the impact of additional years of education on income are positive. But the most interesting part of this, in fact, is that the impact is much bigger for the poor than for the rich. So education is really helping the poor. Uh, the reason, one reason is, when you think about it, it's obvious, 
if somebody at the top of the distribution already has a lot of other assets than education. So if you add one more year of education or one degree to what they're earning, to uh, their uh, past edu existing education, uh, their income as a pr percentage of in income it doesn't go up that much. They already have a house, probably have 10 other houses that they've rented out, they may own land, they may own other, other resources. But the poor don't have these other resources. Education makes a huge difference for them. 